I'd like to thank the organizers of this symposium for this wonderful opportunity and for highlighting my work. The central dogma states that DNA is transcribed into pre-messenger RNA, which is then processed by splicing to remove non-coding introns and join exons to produce mature messenger RNA that can then be translated into proteins to achieve cellular functions. All of these steps are highly regulated to control the expression of genes. Eukaryotic messenger RNAs are extensively decorated with modified nucleosides that are emerging as an additional layer of gene regulation. These modified nucleosides have unique chemical properties compared to canonical bases. And especially if added early to pre-messenger RNA could potentially influence any step of the processing of messenger RNA to influence gene expression. However, the majority of these modifications, we still don't know their functions. I've been particularly interested in one of these, pseudouridine, which is an isomer of the canonical base uridine. And this isomerization is catalyzed by the pseudouridine synthases. There are 13 of these enzymes in human cells, and the vast majority of these have been shown to be causative or associated with a wide range of human diseases. I'll highlight two examples that are at the center of my talk today. For the enzymes PAS7, which mutations that disrupt the catalytic of this enzyme have been shown to cause intellectual disability and microcephaly. Whereas high expression of the pseudouridine synthase PAS1 is observed in hepatocellular carcinoma tumors compared to normal tissue, and high expression of PAS1 is correlated with poor prognosis in hepatocellular carcinoma. Now these diseases could be due to loss or gain of pseudouridines at target RNAs, but in order to understand how pseudouridines contribute to these diseases, we need to know where they are and what they do. Our lab identified pseudouridines in mature messenger RNAs. However, it wasn't clear when in the life cycle of the messenger RNA this modification is added and the function of this modification in cellular messenger RNAs were unknown. Two of the pseudouridine synthases that I just discussed were known to be nuclear or chromatin associated. So I hypothesized that pseudouridine was added to nascent pre-messenger RNA co-transcriptionally, where then it could go on to affect any step of the messenger RNA life cycle. Now to first ask whether pre-mRNA was pseudouridylated co-transcriptionally, I chose the hepatocellular carcinoma cell line, HEPD2, because high expression of the pseudouridine synthases is correlated with poor prognosis in this disease. I then biochemically fractionated cells and isolated chromatin to enrich for pre-messenger RNA, which is still tethered to the chromatin during transcription. I then did pseudouridine profiling to look to identify the locations of these pseudouridines across the nascent transcriptome. So to do this, I took advantage of a chemical that can react with pseudouridines, CMC. And this labels the pseudouridines creating bulky pseudouridine CMC addicts that form roadblocks to reverse transcriptase. So you can um, identify the location of pseudouridines based on reverse transcription where reverse transcriptase will fall off at these addicts. So you can use high throughput sequencing to identify the location of these pseudouridines across the transcriptome. Using this approach, I identified hundreds of novel pseudouridines in nuclear non-coding RNAs and thousands of pseudouridines in pre-messenger RNA, the majority of which were in introns. And I was quite excited about these intronic pseudouridines because of their potential to influence splicing. So I asked, are intronic pseudouridines positioned to affect splicing? I found that pseudouridines and in introns are enriched around alternatively spliced regions. For instance, they're enriched in the introns flanking cassette exons, which are exons that can either be included or skipped from the final messenger RNA to yield distinct protein coding mRNA isoforms. 
Similarly, I found that pseudouridines were enriched around other types of alternative splicing, and that these intronic pseudouridines were generally located close to splice sites or the exon intron boundaries, where regulatory elements for splicing are often found. So having found this distribution, I wanted to ask, do pseudouridines influence pre-mRNA splicing? But in order to do this, I needed to know which of the 13 pseudouridine synthases modify pre-messenger RNA sequences. To ask this, I used a high-throughput in vitro pseudourutilation assay to identify the direct pre-mRNA targets of eight different pseudouridine synthases. And I found that three pseudouridine synthases, PUS1, RPUS4, and PUS7, pseudourutilated the most pre-mRNA sequences. So I prioritized these to perform further experiments to ask what happens to splicing when you've lost pseudourutilation by these enzymes. So I first generated a PUS1 knockout cell line where I depleted PUS1 and then isolated RNA and performed RNA sequencing to look for differential splicing in the knockout compared to the wild type cells. Here's an example showing a cassette exon that's included in the presence of PUS1 and skipped upon PUS1 knockout. And I've highlighted the location of the pseudouridines in the intron downstream of this regulated exon. Strikingly, we found that there were thousands of alternative splicing changes when we knocked out PUS1, the majority of which were in cassette exons, but also other types of alternative splicing. I then depleted the two other pseudouridine synthases that had the most pre-messenger RNA targets and similarly found widespread regulation of alternative splicing upon depletion of these enzymes. So now I've told you that pseudouridine synthases regulate alternative splicing, but I wanted to know whether individual pseudouridines that I identified in cells could directly affect splicing. So to answer this, I made splicing substrates that I either left unmodified or I site-specifically introduced a pseudouridine in vitro with recombinant enzyme and added these to nuclear extracts and quantified splicing to determine the effect of the single pseudouridines identified in cells. And I found that a single pseudouridine was sufficient to enhance splicing in nuclear extracts from two different cell types. So now, next, I wanted to know how do individual pseudouridines affect splicing? Pseudouridines might influence splicing by, for instance, altering the affinity of a splicing factor for its binding site in the pre-messenger RNA sequence. Alternatively, a pseudouridine might stabilize RNA secondary structure to occlude the binding site of a splicing factor in the pre-messenger RNA. And either of these mechanisms could result in differences in splicing choices. Now to ask whether we found pseudouridines positioned to influence the binding of RNA binding proteins, we collaborated with Dean Yo's lab at UCSD, where they've done UV cross-linking, immunoprecipitation, and sequencing of bound RNAs for hundreds of RNA binding proteins in the same cell type. We then overlapped the location of pseudouridines in pre-messenger RNA with the binding sites of these RNA binding proteins. And we found examples like this one where the pseudouridine in this three prime splice site region overlaps the binding site of this three prime splice site recognition factor. And we did this across the transcriptome and found that about 40% of the pseudouridines that we identified in cells are present in the binding sites of RNA binding proteins and splicing factors where they are poised to influence pre-messenger RNA processing. Now, I've told you that pseudouridine synthases install thousands of pseudouridines co-transcriptionally, that these enzymes regulate widespread alternative splicing, that individual pseudouridines can directly affect splicing. This raises many exciting questions that I look forward to addressing in my future lab, such as what are the mechanisms by which individual pseudouridines affect splicing? How is pre-messenger RNA pseudourutilation regulated? Why are some regions targeted for modification and not others? 
does this role of pseudourines and pre-mRNA processing contribute to some of the diseases I talked about in the beginning, such as during neuronal differentiation and in cancer? And finally, do other RNA modifications similarly function in the processing of pre-messenger RNA? With that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and thank the Gilbert Lab for their support.